So in this video I'm going to go over the installation of an aftermarket sub and amp and it's 2017 WRX. Now this car does have a kicker amplified sub upgrade to it that runs about $500 that I could have bought. I decided not to go with that for a couple reasons. Um, main reason that I decided not to go with that is the, the price. The, the sub ran somewhere around $500 and, and I thought you know um, the watts per dollar just wasn't there. Um, so I was able to get a, a sub and an amp for just over $200 that provides me more functionality and more, you know, more power and, um, and and provides me a clean enough installation that, you know, something I can live with. So that's what this video is about. So I'm going to go over the running the power cable from all the way from the battery to, to the, the rear seat, running the, you know, installing ground, running your, your data, your signal cables. Um, removing the radio, all that stuff. I'm gonna go over it all. So it's this video is divided in, in separate parts. So if you're interested in one part or, or another, feel free to you know fast forward or whatever. So when I looked up the kicker sub installation for this car, it just it seemed like you have to go through a lot of trouble to install it. It's not that as plug and play as you would think. It's not simply just you know bolting it back there and, and plugging it in. You know you still have to run cables and do this and that. And if you want um, remote control functionality, you have to go third party. And, and get a, a you know an amplifier amplified level um, control. So I figured if you're gonna go through that you know level of, of uh, involvement in an installation for an OEM you know, uh, sub and amp, then I can just save myself the three hundred dollars, use that three hundred dollars to buy the kicker door speakers and the kicker tweeters, and and still get a better system out of the deal. Also, I, I have the ability to upgrade easily upgrade the sub in the future. So if I get tired of you know 200 watts and, and I want to throw a 12 back there instead or, or a better 10, I can do that easily um, without having to go through a lot of trouble. So that's another good reason that you know for for going aftermarket rather than kicker. So I recorded this video at different stages of the installation, so you might see things already done. Um, I apologize for that in, in advance. I just I wasn't exactly recording as I was installing the stuff. Um, but I, I did try my best to go over everything that I did in the process or everything you need to know that, or that you should know um, that will help you if you decide to do something similar. So um, thanks for watching and I hope you get something out of this. Now before we get started on the specifics of running the amplifier's power cable on this 2017 WRX, I wanted to talk about the importance of properly installing the fuse and fuse placement. You can see here that the fuse is installed about, in this particular example, about four inches from the positive power terminal on the battery. Now that's not by accident, that's actually pretty much a requirement. Um, you want your fuse to be probably within six inches of the battery terminal. You don't want to put it, put it down the line, you don't want to put it by the amplifier, you don't want to put it anywhere but right here close to the battery and the reason for that is that the fuse only protects what the the line after it so in this example it only protects from here out so everything before the fuse is not protected so this little spit bit right here is not protected now I'm not really that concerned about th those you know three four inches of, of uh, cable but I am concerned about the you know 15 feet that I have ran to the back of the car and that's the, the reasoning be behind placing the fuse very close. You don't want it to be any more than maybe six inches. I mean, you can go a little bit more if you're careful where you place it, but you know, if, if, if it's far away from the battery, you're doing it wrong. Now, the reason for that is that if at any point the power cable makes contact with the skin of the car and grounds out, the fuse will immediately blow, and that, that's what you want. Um, and by the fuse blowing, you're preventing the battery from dumping all of its juice onto the car, which will likely blow just about every fuse in the fuse box. And at worst case scenario, it'll make the cable get extremely hot and possibly ca cause a fire. Now, you might think that's very unlikely, depending on where you route the cable, 
But what if you get in a car accident? Things happen. You get in a car accident and that cable gets severed or, or, or part of the car ends up cutting the cable and making a ground with it. Right then and there, you're, you're not in control of the car anymore and the, the battery's gonna dump all the juice onto the car, the cable's gonna get hot, it's gonna cause a fire, you, you don't want it. It's a safety feature, it's a necessity. It, there's no argument about it. You need to install a fuse and you need to install it properly. So you wanna keep that in mind before you start the installation. Fuse placement, that should be the first thing you think about where you're gonna, where you're gonna put the fuse. Right here in this case, I have it secured to, to this uh, bolt right here. It's not going anywhere. Um, so, I mean, it, it, wherever you, you place it, it's up to you. Make sure that it's not just dangling, not loose. Um, the better your installation, the less likely that any issues are gonna pop up in the future. So when you're thinking of where to route the cable, um, you're gonna have choices depending on what car you have. I'm gonna show you where I did it in this car because that's what this video is about, but just a couple general tips here. Um, if, if you end up having to drill a hole for the cable, make sure you use a rubber grommet around that hole, something like this. That way there's no chafing. If you just install the cable and you put it through a hole that you freshly drilled, it, you, it might not happen now, but maybe two years down the line, the chafing will cause the rubber part of the cable to wear down up until the metal and then once that happens you're screwed so make sure that you use a rubber grommet like this or you use an existing one on the firewall now another important safety consideration make sure that you unplug the negative battery terminal when you're working on any sort of electronics in the car but especially when you're working when you're installing an amplifier um, and to be extra safe, make it, wrap it in, in a plastic bag or something like that. So there's absolutely no chance of the battery um, terminal making contact with it with the post. Um, that way, if you accidentally touch, you know, the positive to the chassis of the car or anything like that, that uh, you won't do any damage. So obviously, I already did the installation and routed the cable on this car, but I, that's what this video is about. I want to show you exactly how I did it so that if, if you want to follow suit and you want to do it on your own WRX, um, you know where to go. Because it did take me a little bit to de finally decide where to, where to put the cable and, and how to do it. It's fairly simple once you decide what to do. So um, I'm just basically gonna go from, from the battery all the way back to where the amplifier is to show you. So we're gonna start right here. So this, this shield right here, you're gonna end up having to pop it out. So it's just these two little uh, retainers. that for the retainers so as you can see the cable runs right on the side right there there's actually some cable clips down here where you can put the cable right in there so there's there's the cables not just dangling in there it's actually secure and it goes all the way and I'm gonna show you exactly where it goes here in a second but just so you know while I'm up here, that's where it's ran in here, in the engine compartment. So here we're gonna get into the specifics of running the power cable on the actual WRX. So I, the, the place I chose to run it is right behind this panel right here. And I'm gonna show you, so you have to remove this panel. So you remove these retaining screws. One, there's two, there's another one down here. There's a couple more that we need to remove, one here and one there. So if you haven't gotten yourself some um, panel removal and clip removal tools. They're only like six, seven dollars on Amazon. Um, they're worth every penny. It's nice to have, you buy them one time and, and you'll have them your whole life. So, so I'm gonna grab that. Let's see if that one will work. Maybe this side. There we go. That one comes out. So 
now that we have all the retaining clips out, we can pull the panel. Oh, missing one right there. See it? That's on that one. There it is. Now we can remove it. So you don't have to remove the panel completely. All you have to do is undo those that I showed you, and you kind of just move it out of the way. All right, so now that we have the panel removed, I want to show you where the cable is. You can see it right there. That's the cable right here, this one. That's the cable, okay? So you can see where I put it. I found this grommet right here where this other thick cable runs in, and I thought that's a perfect spot to put the cable um it's a nice thick rubber grommet uh, it'll protect the power cable and it's easily accessible so after fiddling around and looking in the firewall and trying to weigh my options um this was i came down on this um, and there's plenty of room in there to make the hole for the cable so what you're gonna have to do is if, if you go down this route you're gonna have to take a um, razor and basically carve a small hole right there just like a, a slit and it's really hard tough rubber so it might take a couple tries but very carefully above where there's a lot of room carve a slit in there until you can fit the cable through there and then i'm about to show you in a minute where the cable comes through on the other side but um this is a very easy place to put the power cable where it's out of the way and there's actually um cable clips along the way to hold the cable in place so it's not just sitting there dangling so it's a nice quality installation so once you have the power cable through the grommet part of the way in it's time to see where it's going to come out on this side so the first thing you got to do is you have to remove these two panels right here um, this one first and the way you do that is you just snap it out it's very common it's the same for basically every car um, so just be mindful of where the clips are um, sometimes they get stuck on the metal just be mindful of that so once you get this panel out you remove this one there's a retaining clip in the front take that retaining clip out and then it snaps right out i'm not going to do it because it, there's no point but i'm going to show you what it looks like in there So once you get the cable in through there, it's pretty straightforward cable run to the trunk. So you're going to end up running it through there and through here. And there's actual cable trays with clips on there where you can secure that cable very professionally. So there's no, there's no reason why that cable should just be all over the place in there. You could actually secure it very neatly and nicely in there. So you go through there and then you're going to have to move this remove this uh, panel also and uh, I mean you don't have to remove it all the way I didn't you can just un unclip it from the bottom and um, once you unclip it from the bottom you'll be able to see and reach in there enough to actually run the power cable through there once it gets to the other side same deal here so you'll get it this panel will be out that way and you'll be able to get the cable through there and you'll have to remove this panel right here and again, all you have to do is snap it out, and you also have to remove this panel. Probably not, not remove it all, all the way, just kind of snap it out so you can reach it out back behind it a little bit. I'll show you in a second exactly what it looks like in the trunk. All right, after you take off the cargo cover and the spare tie cover you have to remove these retaining clips so you can access underneath this cover right here now the best way to do this the easiest way is just to pull pull up and they'll snap out um, just be sure to hold and hold the the retaining clip on the top while you do it so it doesn't just uh, shoot out which it will shoot out so just
and after you do that, then you can just access underneath. So as you can see, the options are pretty endless in here as to how to route the cables and where to put the ground ground strap. So this is obviously the, the power cable. Here's, here's my grounding strap right there. Um, here's the cable with the uh, speakers and the punch control and the preamp RCA cables. Exactly how the uh, power cable gets ran is dependent on where you will be mounting the amplifier. In my case, it's going to be mounted to the back of the seat. So as you can see right here, it's ideal. Um, once you remove those covers or at least move them out of the way, there's plenty of room down there to route the cable. I left my power cable longer as I want the ability to move the amplifier in the future if need be. Just be sure to secure the cable with zip ties along the way. Now, I'm only running about 200 watts RMS, but I still opted to run a 4 gauge wire even though 8 gauge would have been enough so that if I decide to upgrade the system in the future, I don't have to rerun a power cable. One final thing to note about the power cable is that it should be ran separately from your signal cables. If you run the power cable on the left side of the car and signal cables on the right side, that would be ideal. If you run the speaker cables with the power cable, you run the risk of inducing interference to the speaker cable and it's extremely annoying to put up with if you end up getting that interference. So why risk the power probability? So a few words about grounding. Your grounding cable should look something similar to my cable right here. Um, you should find a bolt that clearly goes through the middle of the car and you should definitely scrape underneath it where the bolt is going to make contact with a Dremel tool or with a scraper or something like that um, to, to get the best connection possible. If you don't have a good connection you can cause clipping um, and your amplifier can shut on and off and you'll have issues and you just don't need it. Um, you can avoid that right off the bat by securely installing this cable. Um, it should be one of the biggest considerations when you install your amplifier. Another thing it should be the same gauge as your power cable. So if you bought an amp kit, an amp installation kit, then you usually don't have to worry about that. Um, but if you didn't, be mindful of that and order your power cable and your ground cable the same gauge. Um, and finally, make sure that this cable is a, absolutely the shortest that it could possibly be for your particular installation. So in other words, at first, d determine where the amplifier is gonna go first and then find out where where to put the grounding strap that way you don't, you don't run the risk of having a, a grounding cable that's too long all right so in order to remove the radio you have to um, unscrew the four bolts that hold it in place there's two on the top right behind these two vents and one on each side so the first thing we got to do is remove these vents right here so they're very easy to do so just the easiest way I found just grab back here Grab on either side, get your nails in there, and kind of pull it out. Then you can just flip it up and just rest it up here. Here you can see the two 10 millimeter bolts on the top of the radio that hold it in place. Once you get that vent, those vents off, um, they're easy to get to and easy to remove. In order to get to the screw on the right hand side, you have to remove the glove box. So to do that, all you have to do is take the um, shock and you snap it out this way. I already did it. Snap it out that way, it comes right out. And then the glove box, you just pull it up. And that's it glove box comes right out. Once you remove the glove box, it's just a matter of getting in there and removing that bolt right there is also 10 millimeters. All right, so the bolt on the left-hand side of the radio, you can see right through here, that way. So you're gonna need a 10 mil, like just like the others, you're gonna need a 10 millimeter socket um, and you're probably gonna need some extensions like like that um so if, yeah i just did that so that i wouldn't lose them in there pulling them out and stuff i've learned my lesson 
with dropping sockets and extensions and stuff trying to pull them out and then they end up dropping in there so I, now I just tape them to prevent that but you can reach it right through there be careful when you're working on here there's actually a, an airbag right here so don't be yanking on it or anything um, but yeah you can reach it and you see it right through there all right so once you remove the four bolts it's time to remove the radio a couple tips uh, have a flathead handy because you're gonna need it to remove the uh, um, connectors there's not a lot of room back there either, so don't yank on too far out on the radio. Uh, when I did this the first time, I actually uh, broke my, the connectors for one of the antennas, and, and I ended up having to you know, fix that. So just be very careful how you pull the, the connectors out from behind the radio. Um, another tip, make sure you put some painter's tape right here, these two spots right here on the trim. Um, the radio is gonna rest there, and if you don't do it, if you don't put painter's tape right there or something else to protect this right here, you're gonna scratch this all up. So just keep that in mind. To uh, remove the radio, you can kind of reach back and pull it out. All right. So here's where all the connectors are, and there's a lot of them. And voila, there's your radio. All right, so this is what the back of the radio looks like. A lot of connectors that go back there. Um, the ones that you're going to be concerned with are these these two right here. These two are the ones that have the, your speaker cables and your accessory and your power. All, all those are on these two connectors right here. Okay, so everything else is, you don't have to worry about anything else. This down here is the temperature control. Here's all the information you might need about the radio. So if you want to look anything up, there's all your info right there. So here's exactly what all your cables behind your radio look like. So where you're gonna end up having to splice for your speaker cables, your speaker wires, is these two right here. And I'm gonna put up on the screen a diagram of exactly which cables you're gonna need to do to tap into, okay? So, um, so as you can see, these are the two speaker wires right here and then the accessory cable um, and then in there also is the punch control cables back there and even though I am not using because the cable the radio does not have preamp output um, I still ran this cable because in the future when I do end up replacing the head unit then I don't have to worry about running a cable because I know obviously any any new head unit that that you're gonna buy is gonna have preamp output so um, it's a very good idea to run the cables even if you don't need it anyways that way when you're ready to upgrade you don't have to worry about running these cables again so as you can see there's a lot of connectors back there a lot of connector these are the ones that you're gonna be concerned with right here the white ones 6 and 10 alright so before I put everything back together a couple things to mention if the amplifier you bought does not have high level inputs, you're gonna have to get a line out converter to convert your speaker, uh, amplified speaker signal to a preamp state. Um, and you can get those anywhere. Um, I didn't have to do that because the amplifier I got had high level inputs. So all I had to do was tap into the speakers directly. Um, so, and I tap, tapped into my rear speakers. And the reason I did that is because this system is very high as it is um, so if you're gonna fade it at all you're gonna fade it to the back so by putting the the speakers tapping into the rear speakers um, basically ensuring that the amplifier always has a hundred percent input so I soldered my cables on there so they're actually soldered in there um, that's all, always the best option if you know how to do it and, and if you're comfortable doing it it's always the best option if you're not you can use something like this to tap into the cable I mean but again if you can solder just solder um, you can also order they sell kits you can also order one of a kit that connects into these two 
and uh, already has the cables coming out of it that, that you need. So you can go down that route. Um, just be sure to order it well ahead of time. That way when you're ready to do your installation, um, you already have everything you need to finish in one go. So last thing I'm gonna mention is to make sure that you use zip ties or something to um, secure your cables, especially like in my case, this cable, I have to secure it back there so it's not just dangling so it doesn't, you know, develop a rattle uh, in the future or anything like that. Um, the, the cleaner your installation, the better. So very quick note, um, to route the cables on this side, there's plenty of room back there, um, a lot of different ways you can do it, but you're gonna have to remove this right here, this um, glove box, you know, frame or whatever you have to remove it and it's very easy to do you just un unscrew all the screws around it just be mindful of the light there's a light right here that's attached to it be mindful of that so you don't yank it out and there's also cables attached to it back there you can see them so there are things attached to it so you can't just unscrew it and pull it out you have to do it uh, carefully so you don't break anything back there All right, so we're basically done with the installation. The amplifier can be secured, just about any amplifier um, can be secured to the back of the seat, which is, there's metal ridges that run on the back of the, the seat. So you can kind of align the holes where the metal is and screw and secure the amplifier to the back of the seat. Um, and, and now your amplifier can breathe and it's not covered with anything, and it's perfect. Um, the sub, Fits the sub, you have to actually consider, if you get this exact sub, you have to really, really align where you put the sub when you mount it, and I'll show you why. So here you can see how I mounted the sub to the back of the seat, same way as I did the amplifier. It's, it's attached right to the metal, and there's two of these on the top, so the sub doesn't go anywhere and, and it's secure on here. Now, the reason why I say you really have to measure before, if you buy this exact sub, is because watch how it fits perfectly on there. You can't really move the sub up anymore either, because if you move the sub up, you won't be able to open the seat. So it's almost as if this sub was designed for this car. It's, it literally fits there exactly perfect with no room to spare on the top or the bottom. So be very if you get this sub, be very mindful of measuring exactly, placing it where you need it and marking it before you secure it so that you don't end up having to remove it again to readjust it. This is what the completed system looks like. You can still roll down the seats. The only thing left to do here is get a grill cover for the sub so that whenever I have stuff in the trunk you know I don't run the risk of uh, actually puncturing the, the you know foam or something so yeah I'm gonna get um, a grill for the sub to, to finish out the installation but I mean that sub right there is perfect it doesn't take take up you know it takes about as much room as the you know kicker uh, sub does it's just not as conveniently placed as as the kicker um, sub but I'm happy, I don't regret it at all. So that's it, that wraps up video four of the series. Video five is gonna be the upgrade of the head unit. That's not gonna be for a while on the road. I know I said five years, but it's gonna happen sooner. Um, I, there's some functionality there and, and that that I need that I don't have with this head unit. And I wanna be able to control the music a little bit more than this unit allows. So I'm probably gonna put an Android system in there or something uh, probably next year or so. So, you know, step by for that if you're interested. Um, so now that I've had the system for a while, so I have the kicker tweeters, I have the kicker door speakers, and now I have this aftermarket sub and amp combo. The aftermarket sub and amp combo is, the amp is 500 watts RMS. The sub is only 200 watts, and I did it that way in order in, in order to be able to in, in, um, upgrade in the future if I wanted to. So now I have that ability. So if, if I decide that this is not enough at some point, or that it, my taste change and, and I want some more, some more bass, then I can just you know get another sub in there and just basically plug and play at that point. So I have some wiggle room there, and, and I like that ability. I would not have been able to do that with the kicker sub. So for the price of the kicker sub alone. 
I got an aftermarket amp and sub plus installation kit. I got four door speakers, kicker door speakers, and I got two tweeters for the price of the, you know, of the kicker sub alone. So I'm happy. That, and that was one of the main reasons why I didn't go on the kicker sub route. Um, another one, another reason is because I like to have the ability to control the bass from, from the head unit, and I got that now. So I can turn it off all the way if I need to, or turn it up depending on what kind of music I'm listening to. And, and I really, I appreciate that, I like that. So I'm, I'm really happy with the system the way it is. It's not gonna rattle your neighbor's windows whenever you, you, know, you pull it into your house. It's nice tight bass it, and it's confined to the car, which I like, and it's, you know, it does the job. It really does. Uh, for me, for my personal taste, it's enough. You know, 212s would be way too much for me. So, you know, this, this is perfect. Um, so if you want to go down the same route, that, that's what you can expect. So you, you can basically expect the kicker sub a, a little bit more than the kicker sub, plus the ability to control it at will. So that's what I did. Um, so if you've uh, watched the other videos, I appreciate it. Watch this one too, I appreciate it. I hope that you picked up something along the way, even if you didn't do this yet, or if you not, don't even have the car yet or whatever. I hope you learned something. Um, and I appreciate you watching and take care.